Hello, everyone. John White here from PCT Learning Center and... Gene Quinn over here from IP Watchdog. Now, the only thing that is the same this uh, week, uh, or this month, rather, for the PCT Learning Center question and answer session is the background, which is uh, eminently transportable. And so I brought it here to IP Watchdog Studios, which is operated by my guest, Gene Quinn. So this is fun. He's going to be a guest in his own studio for our program. I love it. You know, yeah. and of course, uh, Gene and IP Watchdog, including Renee and everybody who helps with IP Watchdog, set all this up. So um, I want to thank them at the outset for all their stalwart support of PCT Learning Center. And I look forward to uh, our collaboration into the future. Uh, all right. So what is today? So and yeah, maybe yeah. Start with because we have a whole <laughs> well, bunch of folks here that probably don't know exactly what this is about. Exactly. What is today? Well, here is today. Every month, uh, PCT Learning Center, all the students there, uh, are invited to a live question and answer session with respect to any topic that they've learned about from the PCT Learning Center uh, group of programs. And this, we invite paralegals, we invite attorneys, we invite agents, whomever uses our uh, uh, programs and they're allowed to come along and invite a friend or two and listen in and ask questions. So I got a couple of questions here, but what we also do is we try to have a, a topic led discussion. And so I'll talk about how to open a WIPO account, <clears throat> what to do to obtain provisional rights in a Hague uh, application, something that you may not be familiar with. Um, all the things that are tips and tricks of practice with respect to um, PCT Hague and uh, Madrid filings, but also we're going to be adding, just so you know, <clears throat> coming up, we're going to be adding EPO practice. We're going to have uh, EPO speakers come on and tell us what to expect when you go PCT Chapter 2, when you select the EPO. And then also, what is the best way and what your expectations should be when you enter the P, uh, EPO straight up as an applicant uh, after the, the uh, international phase is over? So we have lots of interesting topics uh, as the year goes through, as well as any programming that you're watching at uh, PCT Learning Center, getting your, your training done. So here we go. This is a typical month. We have some slides up, uh, and so we'll just begin the discussion. And Gene, I love to have in on these discussions because he likes to contribute, but also, importantly, Gene represents the typical level of knowledge of these things among practitioners. But as I was thinking about that on the way over here, Gene actually knows a lot more because <clears throat> he teaches it with me. <laughs> yeah, so I know a little bit more than your average, uh, than your average. average person. Um, so what, what, we, what we talked about in the, the email that went out from, to IP Watchdog is we're going to try and cover as much as we possibly can about the PCT in 60 minutes. And we're also going to include Hague and uh, Madrid too. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to, so we're going to cover the gamut of international practice here. And if you have questions, you can, uh, well, actually, let me just move, move the slide deck forward. Cause I have a slide here. So you can access this uh, slide deck right now on the go to webinar control panel by uh, clicking handouts and downloading mm -hmm. it onto your computer. And you'll notice right below that or right around there, there'll also be a questions tab as well. So if you have questions throughout the um, hour, you can send them there. I will periodically, you'll see me focusing off to my to my left um, and I'll be looking to see if we have any questions coming in and we'll try and weave in as many questions as we can so we can make this you know personal for you guys to get some questions answered. So um, with that, John, I'll kick it back over to you. All right, so let us begin. Here is the major problem. Go ahead, Gene, go to the next uh, slide if you can there. Uh, and I guess the slide after that. Here's the problem with practicing in this area. Number one, there's limited knowledge among practitioners. Um, people say, yeah, I know what a PCT is, I know what a Hague filing is and so forth, but do they really? And even if they do, do they have the vocabulary to make it digestible and understandable to somebody who doesn't have their understanding? And the reason that's so important is the way you get business and the way you tell the decision makers about potential strategies is to put it into a form and format that they can understand. 
And, and you know, we can't, we have to get away from the secret handshake language that uh, IP attorneys love to use. The more technical and the more arcane, the more we admire each other. Um, and that's just not very useful to those who are trying to make strategic decisions about what to do. So let's begin at the very top. <clears throat> so begin with um, patents. Think patents and PCT, they go together. You've known about this since you took and passed the agent's exam or the um, patent bar exam, depending on what they called it. <laughs> now it's the patent office uh, something else exam, registration, registration exam. exam. Um, in any case, uh, PCT covers tangible inventions. That is what we would call utility applications here in the United States. So anything that is a method, anything that's a device, anything that's a composition, and so forth. That is what a PCT can be used for. Uh, industrial designs are what we call design patents, but in literally the rest of the world are in called industrial designs. Here's the quirk about industrial designs around the world though. In most countries, literally nine out of 10, industrial designs are a registration system. They, there is no substantive examination. The only thing they're looking for is are your drawings good enough? And have you run afoul of some local cultural thing in terms of what you're trying to get an industrial design on? And typically you haven't, unless it's something that borderlines uh, on obscene or something like that. But believe me, that, that's just not an issue. In the United States and a handful of other countries, there is substantive examination for novelty, but in most countries that is not the case. And so, PEG is an easy way to project rights around the world because it's not examination based. At least it's not substantive examination based as it is here in the United States. So I have a point of interest here now, and you probably know this, but this was news to me. Um, we just published yesterday about how Davis, you're familiar with Davis, the artificial intelligence life form that has been filing patent applications <laughs> yes. as an inventor. Obviously, they're not the ones filing it, uh, but the creators of Davis uh, are, are trying to probe whether or not an a invention that has been invented, conceived by an artificial intelligence can be patented. Well, they've been rejected in the, in the US because there's no in human inventor it must be a human but south africa just issued the first patent mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. in south africa um because it was based on a pct filing and all south africa does is review the utility applications for <laughs> formalities uh -huh. they issued the filing and essentially in south africa uh they they do it like an after the fact kind of review if it matters it, if it comes up during litigation it seems then they will check on it. So I guess I didn't realize that there were these host of countries that if you file a PCT application um, and then you enter into that country, all they really do is they do a form, mm -hmm. formal check, not a substantive review, and then you get the patent. Now, question whether or not the patent ultimately will be upheld, but you know it, it is a, a quick route to getting a patent in some countries if those countries matter to you well that's true i mean we because we practice in the united states most of the people uh on this uh program we believe that the united states the way it's done is the way it's done around the globe and that's just not true it, it is true in many of the uh let's say the first world or uh you know countries that are uh we consider you know g10 and stuff like that there's some sort of substantive examination but in many countries you know Patents uh, and intellectual property, they're there because these countries are members of the WTO, so they have to have some semblance of an IP um, protection protocol, but it's not nearly the same as it is here in the United States. In many countries, for example, in the EU even, you uh, subordinate your own examination to whatever's done by the EPO, and then, right. it, and then when it comes to your country, it's literally just registration. Uh, you know, you file up a... a, a translation and uh, you pay some money and it's it's more or less registered in that country well maybe south africa has a similar approach with respect to uh, the pct you know if pct concludes that there's something novel or obvious they're prepared to accept that now with respect to whether or not a human being <coughs> is the actual inventor that is a question that is not asked by very many countries it's and see that was the key is apparently 
when uh, Eileen, <clears throat> and Eileen, for those of you who are unfamiliar, she's the editor-in-chief of our publication at IP Watchdog. When she was talking to attorneys who are, you know, expert in the knowledgeable in the law in South Africa, they do not have a question about inventorship in their in South African law, as far as our research told us. Well, inventorship may make a difference in terms of conversion, like where'd you get this from? Did you steal it? But by and large, around the world, the issue with respect to patents is ownership, not inventorship. The United States uh, almost has a fetishized interest in inventorship, you know, and this bothers a lot of applicants from around the world because they're like, why do you guys care so much about the inventor? They're not paying for any of this. They work for us. They're happy that we're doing this. They're happy for the rec. Why do we need their signatures and all this stuff? You know, they're, it's hard enough to get the invention disclosure, let alone <laughs> the 10 signatures required on assignments, powers of attorney, and other things that you nut job Americans require. But and, and <laughs> hard enough to get any invention disclosure, let alone uh, one that's meaningful. I mean, my, yeah. goodness, my goodness. Yeah, so, no, we here in the States, again, it's a question of projection. We think, well, the inventor matters so much here, it must matter elsewhere. Not really, not really. It's ownership trumps inventorship in most of the rest of the world. And so, industrial designs, uh, getting back to our slide, this covers uh, stuff that you can hold in your hands. It's industrial objects, but it also covers, and this is very important for all you computer folks out there, it covers graphical user interface. It covers icons, including animated stuff. So swipe, swipe, up, down, conversion and changes of an animated GUI are very much a part of designs now. Designs are evolving very rapidly and they're becoming increasingly a factor in the look and feel of how software um, interacts with a user. So utility applications cover what's going on behind the screen, but often the design application covers what's going on that can be seen on the screen. And so don't leave that aside, it's vital. Uh, and so Hague is your quick route to get there. Uh, we have Madrid for trademarks and uh, you know this is also underutilized. All of these are very underutilized with respect to what's coming out of the United States, but Madrid has its particular uses and we'll go over those, but Madrid is all about trademarks. What's a trademark? It's a tangible indication of origin. Now, and then there's copyright. That's the Berne Convention. I throw that in because after all, we're IP lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's primarily artistic. Yes, there is overlap on occasion with trademark and industrial designs, but that occasionally they bump into each other. The best example that I have that I've researched over the years, the Coca-Cola bottle, it started out as an industrial design here in the United States. Uh, it eventually became a copyright, or, or it eventually became a trademark for the Coca-Cola company and has since, by virtue of the ubiquitous use of Coca-Cola bottles in artistic renderings, it is completely capable of copyright. So uh, there you go. This is extremely short. You can explain all of this to somebody in the span of a minute who's not familiar with IP. So hang on to that slide. That's a way to talk IP to people who are not in the business. Yeah, and just in case um, when we get to Madrid, we're pressed on time and we don't get to it. Again, we just did recently a webinar on, uh, on China and we had, it was a trademark webinar on China. And again, the expert we had said, if you're going to be going to China, you don't want to use Madrid. Madrid is great with everywhere else in the world. <laughs> and I can't sit here and well, tell you except that. Except China and the United States, as it turns out, but right. never mind. <laughs> well, we're already here. We're already right? here. Yeah, so. So. But um, so I can't explain to you why that is, but every trademark expert that I talk to say says, uh, don't use Madrid with China, use the domestic Chinese uh, application system. And I guess it's, it's alluring because it's still, it's cheaper and you can get on file in China real easy with Madrid, but it just causes all kinds of complications. So just don't do it, um, is what I'm told, so. Uh, yeah, and, and what, I'll give you just a little thumbnail on that particular issue. Uh, it happens to do mostly with classification, right. and its goods fall into one class in Locarno, another class in the United States, and yet another class in China. And so what you have is this lack of correspondence with respect to what your mark's going to be used on, 
And this is hard to fix because once you go through the Madrid system, it's cast in stone. And you realize, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm falling outside of stuff that's vital to me. And, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to fix. So it, it's classification. It's not the mark itself. It's where it ends up being, um, the classes it ends up being registered in. Yeah. All right, so just to review, what's the traditional system? Well, uh, as Gene says, I always like, like to go back to Mesopotamia, but yeah. not this time, Gene. Oh, okay, no. Okay, but be very careful here. Wherever <laughs> he starts in history, he's going to jump to modern times very fast. That's right. So we get in our time machine uh, and we go back to the late 1800s when the Industrial Revolution is really um, roaring. And people are talking about, well, how can we protect our stuff uh, in partners that we trade with? And so the Paris Agreement is put together. This is the oldest intellectual property agreement. And if you want to read it, it's kind of interesting, I suppose. It's in the back of your MPEP. You probably forgot that. It's the P pages, P for Paris. It's an appendix in the back. In any case, it set up a couple of fundamental protocols, and it is this. You start in a member country, and within a certain time frame, you can file in any other member country, your original filing being a placeholder in every member of the Paris system. Wow, that's wonderful, except it really puts you under the gun at whatever their time limit is. It's six months for designs, it's 12 months for utility applications, and so you still have an awful lot of money to spend at that threshold. And so the later uh, agreements, PCT and Hague, are uh, intended to help address this harsh harshness of the uh, timelines of Paris. But there's Paris, you file at 12 months, you can file in any other member country, obtaining the benefit of your earlier filing. And as I said, six months for industrial designs. All right, so here's a PCT timeline. Now, for many of you, this is uh, sad, but many of you, the last time you saw this was when Gene and I went over it with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, when you got your registration number and you kind of forgot about it after that. So I'm gonna walk you through it and then I'm gonna talk to you about the nuances, but fundamentally, most trails to PCT begin with some sort of national filing. And, in the case of the United States, that's typically a provisional application. That's usually what you kick off with. And right there, you have the PCT filing at 12 months. Why is it 12 months? Paris, by golly, that's your 12-month date still in existence from Paris. But here's what happens. You don't have to file uh, in every member country. Instead, you file a single application that acts as an ongoing placeholder in what is by now 155 members. I know one of my slides here says 152 or something. It's now 155 member countries around the world. That, for all intents and purposes, is 100% of world GDP. What happens after you file a PCT? Well, there's nothing more required of the applicant. Instead, the WIPO kicks into gear. They do a search, they publish, and they give you um, a written opinion, at least a search report, that relates to the search that they've done. They give you the results of that, they publish your application, and then it's up to you what happens next, but the next date you really care about is the new time limit for entering into what we call the national stages, and that's at 30 months. But even that, the blow of that is alleviated a little bit by regional patent offices. So at 30 months, if you want to cover Europe, you enter the EPO. That's the European Patent Office. That covers uh, really all of Europe and with a few hangers on now that allow um, registration in their countries, you get even a little, you know, Europe plus a few. Yeah, yeah, it's Europe plus. I mean, you get Turkey too. Yeah. I believe, right? Tur I'm pretty sure Turkey is it. EPO. Yeah, it's not EU, but it is EPO, right. and so that, that's a few, a couple others. That's a that's another thing that you learn in in this practice that EPO and EU are not coincident. Right. Uh, for example, the UK still part of the EPO, right. not a part of and the EU. And there's a couple countries. Is it, uh, sweet, is it Sweden? Or there's a couple that are in the EU that are not a part of the EPO. That that's true too. Yeah. And so just you know if Norway, the, I think, it, is one of them. Norway is one of them. Yeah. So just pay attention to that uh, when you're getting these registrations, that if you really want all of Europe, you'll have to file uh, perhaps an extra application here and there. But in any case, there's this um, segment in there that's called PCT Chapter 2, 
you can, if you want, get something called an international preliminary examination conducted by uh, the, a patent office of your choice. Now, these choices vary depending on where you're coming from, but you can go ahead and get an international preliminary examination to give you a heads up as to uh, whether or not there's a likelihood you're gonna get a patent. So they'll actually look at your specification, they'll look at your drawings, they'll look at your claims in a substantive way, looking for novelty, inventive step, and industrial applicability. These roughly correspond to 101, 102, 103, and 112. So it's a, it's a very similar review, if not using the same labels, and that's optional, though. chapter two, completely optional, but here's a tip, many people use it if they're finding their way back to the US because it cuts down on your fees in the United States. And many people use it on the way to the EPO, they'll choose the EPO because the EPO will more or less use exactly what they've done in PCT chapter two as the starting off point for their examination once you get to the EPO. So mm -hmm. it, it's not just a heads up, it's, it's like um, a preview. And that's of, also of the coming attraction. The basis for PPH too in the US, right? Uh, that's right. And we'll get back yeah. to PPH here in just a moment. That's patent prosecution highway. So we have a question here. I don't know whether you want to tackle this now or not. It's from one of our friends in Chicago. I read recently an opinion piece regarding the advantage uh, over filing under 371 of using the bypass route for U US filings based on a PCT application. Do you have thoughts? Well, the thing about um filing in the United States once you filed a PCT is based on the following. A PCT vis-a-vis -vis the United States is considered to be the functional equivalent of a US non-provisional application. All right, let's just keep that in mind. What can you do with a non-provisional application? You can file a continuation, you can file a divisional, you can file a CIP. Interesting, all right. So when you get to the 30 month period and it's time to enter the national phase, either fish or cut bait. You can enter early, but that's the limit, 30 months. If you enter through 371, whatever you file in the United States is gonna be a replica of what was on file with WIPO, a replica. It is just gonna be a straight up continuation more or less. It, it is what it is you file here. But if you file uh, something called a bypass continuation, why do they call it a bypass? Because you're bypassing, quote, national stage. And instead, you're entering the United States just like any other regular U.S. filing. So you can file a divisional. And importantly, you can file a CIP. And this is often the realization that people come upon when they're entering national phase is, there's a lot more I'd like to say that has not yet been put into my international application. How do I do that? You file what is called a bypass CIP and enter the US as a straight up non-provisional application claiming the benefit of your earlier non-provisional application, but which happens to be a PCT. So think of a PCT as a worldwide provisional in the case of the United States, it's a worldwide, it's a U.S. non-provisional, and so there are advantages uh, to each. Um, so it's that it's that provisional that doesn't go abandoned. Is what it, it is. That's right. Yeah. It's the provisional that keeps on living, and the even better thing, at least with respect to the U.S., is let's suppose you screw up and you miss that 30-month date. This can be revived as to the United States because it's a non-provisional application. Can you revive a non-provisional application? Sure. Sure. You can't revive a provisional though. You can't revive a provisional though, but you can revive a non-provisional. So PCTs are really, when you start to learn more about them, they're the Swiss army knife in our toolbox. Well, they really are. Yeah. I mean, Gene, think about this. I'm not going to be an advocate for Bitcoin or anything, but let's suppose you're in the business of Bitcoin and you've got lots of patents pending on how you do your mining and stuff like that. And what do you know, you start getting kicked out of countries because you keep taking the grid down because of all the power you're using. And now you got a hopscotch around the world looking for a place to go. Wouldn't it be nice to have PCTs pending yeah. where wherever you hopscotch to, there's the possibility of perfecting your rights there? Yeah. You, you know, I mean, right now, all supply chains have been sort of tossed up into the air and we're gonna see where they come down. Wouldn't it have been nice at right. the outset of this madness to file PCTs? Because then you'd have, well, now we have some options.
you right. know? And, and what's the cost? Well, we'll go over the cost, but it's very little more than a single national filing in another country. Well, in, you know, I am also been a fan of PCTs simply because of the chaos with respect to patent eligibility in a lot of, in, in the, in the U S I mean, for example, I mean, you in a lot of areas, you do not want to get to examination any quicker than you absolutely have to. And so, right. And there's a, a PCT gives you 30 months that you could just totally be dragging your feet. And, um, you know, I keep saying it and eventually it will be right. It's that this one-on-one -on -one stuff has to sort itself out. Otherwise we're all just going to go home, right? <laughs> we're and all going to start doing real estate. Because settlements. it just keeps getting worse and worse. I mean, now the latest is if you haven't been paying attention and probably many of you on, on this webinar, you, you have been, but um, the federal circuit says a digital camera isn't is abstract. I can assure you it's not. We're using a mirrorless digital camera right now to broadcast. Are, it is not abstract. You are viewing us through an abstract idea, right? Now. So I have written and and this has to win it's a the day. Brand, you know, a right? Brand. But that if I take the abstract idea, Your Honor, and I throw it at your head, and it's going <laughs> to leave a scar, that can't mean it's abstract. It yeah. has to actually exist. It now, does, in fact. It, it does, exists. in fact, exist. So um, eventually, this is going to get sort sorted out, and it'll probably get s sorted out with uh, the Supreme Court because Congress is just hopelessly uh, lost on on this. They can't get anything done. All right, let's go on to our, our next um, so that's that. that's so next that slide. question. Next slide. Um, so uh, it's 153 countries up there. It's really 155. But here's, here's some things that I want you to think about and communicate when you're talking PCT. Because look, people come to you for advice. Many, too many patent attorneys think I'm an order taker. You, client, come to me with what you want yeah. done and I merely execute it really is that what they're looking for you're supposed to be the wizard of what's possible and so start teaching what's possible and don't go with the well i've not really filed many pcts in fact i haven't filed any so i'm not going to talk about it really it's <laughs> is, not that hard is that giving good advice not talking about things you don't know much about no you need to learn about these things so here this is the big message of pct leverage leverage if you tell a client, uh, a, a startup company, I can give you the effect of a worldwide provisional in a 100% of world GDP, the one that's not a part of it is Argentina. So take away Argentina, 99% of world GDP for the same price or very nearly the same price as filing one additional application. Would you go for that? I have a client, uh, a new client who just said, holy cow, I didn't know that was possible. My last patent attorney didn't tell me. I sure wish he had. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. You know, all right. Also, for you tech transfer folks out there, the PCT system at WIPO has a licensing availability um, chart. People can search for what they might like to pick up, what's interesting. So you can put stuff in their licensing availability site, their portal there on the uh, WIPO website. And you can start to reel in licensees, potential licensees from across the world. Yeah. Wow, then you'll know where to file your national stages. You know, the thing about what's going on in the EPO and what's going on in WIPO over the last decade is it's like the ship's passing in the night with the US. It really literally is. The substantive law, the support from those uh, agencies, I know EPO is not a government agency and WIPO is you know, a, a UN, so it's a bunch of governments. Um, you, it's it's the way the U.S. used to be, the support the U.S. used to provide. So if you're not familiar with what's going on with WIPO and EPO, you really need to familiarize yourself because it, it really is opening up an entire new world. The other thing and I'll say about the value of Proposition, John, is you know, if you go to these events and you talk to the business people, they'll tell you today, the last time I was talking to them was is that the, your U.S. patent portfolio is as valuable as your worldwide portfolio now from a licensing perspective. Now, 10 years ago, people would have laughed at you if they, you had said, well, my international portfolio is equally as valuable as my U.S. portfolio. And 20 years ago, was it would have been even more, you would, they would have put you in a yeah. straitjacket. Yeah. You know, and so your international portfolio is is becoming much more valuable, and it's because of the, the receding power and because of the weakness of the U.S. patent. 
Um, and it, it, it is what it is. You know, I'm not saying it's good. It's not bad. I mean, you probably know what my feeling is on it, but we all have to recognize it just is. And the patents are getting stronger around the world. So if you're not trying to get patents elsewhere around the world, you're 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 having a going to have a problem with respect to your portfolios. Right. No, that's absolutely right. Uh, things are expanding rapidly, and you need to be a part of it because you know maybe you you represent clients who don't want a future. <laughs> you know, maybe that's your situation. They they want to get smaller. They they don't want a seat at the table, and that's my next point here. A pending application is at the seat of the table of the future. That's what it is. It is participation because what is being filed on now is what will be enforced and licensed in five, 10 years. Maybe your company doesn't want to be a part of that around the world. Maybe their vision is just the United States. Well, I got news for you. The United States is 18% of the world GDP and getting smaller, not because our uh, economy is getting smaller, but because the world is getting bigger. Our role in it is proportionally smaller, even if we're growing as well. So be a part of the future beyond our shores, because that's where the future lies. And, and that, Comes to you let, let me just tell a quick anecdote. You know, people say, well, I, you know, we're never going to do this overseas. We're never going to do this. We're never going to do that, whatever. Look, did, did I ever think I was going to be doing what I'm doing right now? I can assure you, no. I mean, th these things happen. They grow around. And, and J John and we were just talking, the studio that I've built, we will have used this week almost certainly every day and sometimes twice in a day and, and sometimes i was using it twice with you but i was using it three and four times a day every day <laughs> this week who would have thought just a few years ago ip watchdog would be a multimedia company right you know? and we're playing our big huge event in for for texas in september and you never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. but what you what i can predict with great certainty is that if you are not trying to plan for the future the future is going to pass you by Yes. And the future right now is uh, for the patents is Europe and China. And I'm not saying ignore the U.S. You have to have U.S. portfolio, but presumably your clients already got get that message. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, depending upon what the invention is, you might want some protection in South America. You may want some protection in Africa. I mean, and don't forget Africa, because Africa, if you look at the WIPO numbers, is growing um, quite significantly. And I'm a fan of saying, look, if big companies are filing somewhere, you ought to pay attention because they, they probably know what's going on, and they are filing in Africa. And, and protection in Africa through the PCT uh, hedge is extremely straightforward because there are two regional patent offices in Africa, one that covers most of the French-speaking African nations and another that covers ostensibly the English-speaking but other languages. So it's it's like the EPO, but for Africa, you can get much of Africa uh, through those two respective regional offices. So it's an easy jumping off point, PCT, to those regional offices in Africa. So take advantage of that. Take advantage of it. All right, our next, and then we have a few more, you know, securing supply line exclusivity and hedging. And I've already spoken about those two points. All right, now here's so a- So this is the big one this, for me. This is the big one for Gene, and it goes like this. Here in the United States, the patent office is backed up, but it's backed up in an uneven fashion. For some of us, it's rather more backed up than others and, and vice versa. Well, how would you like to jump to the head of the line? There's a couple of ways to do it in the United States. Pay big money, that's prioritized examination. The limit there, of course, is there's only 10,000 that are possible in any given calendar year, but also it costs real money, like $4,000. Well, how would you like to do it for free? Oh, I know, file a PCT, get a positive written opinion from your international searching authority or your chapter two authority. And when you enter the US national phase, you jump to the head of the line with respect to the claims that correspond to the positive written opinion. So the money that you would otherwise have spent jumping into prioritized examination, you can preserve rights around the world for up to 30 months through a PCT. And if you get a positive uh, written opinion in any phase, chapter one or two in PCT, that paves the way for you to PPH in the United States. Now you go, well, you know, I don't know, you know, PPH. Okay, Gene, let's look at the next couple of slides, which just <laughs> blows your ignorance out of the water okay and I, i've just gone over this this is eligibility but the only uh, requirement is substantive examination hadn't begun 
But look at this, look at this slide right here. And um, this was put together by the US Patent Office, our friends at the US Patent Office. And it goes like this, look what happens to PPH. And the, the petition to first action, and uh, I want you to notice the thing that matters, allowance. Look at the speed to allowance. Look at the um, uh, first action, 11.2 months. But look at the next slide that we're gonna go to. Everything speeds up. But the best part of this is allowance rates. Look at the allowance rates of PPH applications, 90%. Now I want you to tell your client, seriously, we don't wanna do this because you might be subject to a 90% allowance rate at the US Patent Office. Yeah, the Delta is almost 40%. Look at what the non-PPH applications 30, are. 38% 50, I mean, Delta. I mean, come on. You know, and, it, and for God's sake, if you're in an area which has a, a low, oh, I hit, hit the next, yeah. let me go back. Yeah. If you're in a, uh, uh, an area that has a low allowance rate, I mean, my goodness, my goodness. And so th this is something you're not telling your client about because you're like, well, I, I don't find many PCTs. Oh, really? And so you're you're going to put them in the 51% pile as opposed to the 90% pile because you don't want to See, and this learn is about self -serving, this. self-serving, my God. I mean, clients like getting patents. That's actually you know. why, they, why they come to you. Now, and we all know the large clients are not going to listen to your advice anyway. They're going to do what they want to do and let, let them do what they want to do. But the clients that are going to listen to you, this is in their best interest. It is in your best interest because if you're helping them get patents and you're helping them get patents quicker, they're going to they're gonna okay. keep coming back to you. And the thing is, is it's going to be cheaper for them, not only from the, from the filing fees, but it's going to be streamlined from the prosecution fees. Yeah, because here's what happens. Did you notice in the slide previous how many actions to allowance? It's fewer with respect to PPH than it is for ordinary prosecution. And there's very many fewer RCEs. So the money that would have been spent on amendments and RCEs can be spent on a PCT. So even if you have no interest in going anywhere else in the world, it's worth filing a PCT to hedge that and also to advance your situation in the United States for free. So, and so, and let, let me just, let me keep going back to this, right? Because look at look, that Delta. Because the thing is, is I've done a lot of webinars, John, as I think, you know, over the last year That's on- That's an right now, I know. I, but, you are Mr. Webinar. Yeah. But also, <laughs> but specifically on law firm operations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, everybody's going after the same clients, the same, you know, you're pitching yeah. the same. So what, what, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to use, uh, artificial intelligence or platforms or technology to streamline things, to enhance what you're doing, to explain to clients that this is what I can do. I can do it faster, cheaper, better. And you're trying to get more work that way and so forth. Um, and you all know that for most clients, you're not the only attorney that they use. Maybe the small clients are the only attorney that they use. But if you can return a, on a Delta like this and and bump up their allowance rate compared to what their other attorneys are doing and do it faster and cheaper, you're gonna get more work, you know? And if you could be using this in your pitches and explain, yeah, no, this is how, why we recommend the, the international process and this is how we work it. And the, the other clients that had a lot of success with it and everything. I mean, this is the way to get work today in 2021. You have to be business savvy and business creative. And um, I don't, there, there's too few people filing design applications proper in the US, and there's too few people using the P PCT. And, and there's too few Hague filings, and we'll, we'll talk, we'll get, I mean, we'll get to that here the, in a minute. The, the PCT rate of take up originating out of the US is less than one in five US applications originating here end up being filed as a PCT. That means 80% of filings are leaving this on the table. Just. Come on. So, so does this? We have a question. Does this uh, slide indicate it's better to prosecute elsewhere and then PPH to the USPTO? Well, well, remember that if you file a PCT, one, and you know you're waiting for a positive result. So, how quickly does that search result and opinion come? It comes within about four months after you filed your PCT. Because here's here's what's really going on at PCT. They're not going to publish for a while, for 18 months. But in the United States, they just forward all these things for the search and the opinion uh, right away because they're under a four-month clock. So if you file a PCT and you get your search result and opinion back, 
that's enough for you to jump into PPH. You don't have to wait for 30 months. Right. You know, you, you don't, that timeline is maximum. So if you're interested in jumping to the head of the line in the United States, file a PCT here, they'll forward it for search and so forth. You'll get that back in about four months. You'll be ready to go. So you don't have to really prosecute it anywhere else. You could just do the, uh, the search through uh, WIPO. You know, and and that's going to be good because you know the the U.S. examiners they know it's a it's a quality search. You know, they know that they've gone into it. They and they rely on it. You know, that's why the numbers are what the numbers are. Well, I mean, are. PPH gets you to the head of the line, and remember, you already have favorable treatment on something. This is low hanging fruit for a U.S. examiner. And and remember, you don't have to stick with that. You can file a continuation for what's left on the table after that. Yeah. You know, no problem. Yeah. All right, so next up we have Hague. Now, what is Hague? Hague is different from PCT in that uh, ordinarily the Paris route for Hague is within six months, you have to file all your uh, applications in whatever uh, Paris countries you want. The Hague system actually files them for you with a single application, unlike PCT where you have to take extra steps at 30 months, Hague is the extra step. Your Hague filing is a national filing in the countries that you identify and pay for, and the fees are quite inexpensive. Uh, I have a demonstration I did with uh, Jess from uh, WIPO. She's their Hague uh, spokesperson, uh, and she has an example where you save literally by a factor of about uh, one-fourth of the money to cover the same countries using Hague as opposed to filing directly. So. It saves money, and here's the important thing, you're only shooting at a single set of formal requirements. Whereas if you file individually in all these countries, each is gonna have their own drawing requirements, their own spec requirements, which are brief, but nonetheless their own, and you're gonna have to uh, hire and pay a foreign associate. Through Hague, you hit one set of formality requirements for drawings, one set of formality requirements for your specification. There is no translation because it's already in English, and you don't have to hire a foreign associate, bang, you filed your application in all the countries that you've identified and paid for. Wow. And remember, most of them are not examination-based in a substantive way. They're not looking for novelty. They're just looking for, uh, you know, uh, things that are culturally offensive. And, and by and large, you're not going to run into that. So, and, and why would you do this? Well, Gene and I were talking. You know all that tooling you pay for to have your products made in other countries? You know how they say it's exclusive for you with respect to what you buy? Indeed, it is. But what about all that others are using or are buying and selling using your tooling where it's sold in Africa, it's sold in South America, it's sold in Eastern Europe in places where you don't think to go. And you travel to these places and you go, gee, I see my product right there on the shelf, but huh, that's actually not being sold by us. That's right. It's being sold by your factory that you don't control, but it's not being sold by you. How do you put a stop to stuff like that? Hague is the way to increase your IP footprint for very little money. And you may say, well, all my stuff is utility stuff. Oh, really? I can tell you headlights, bumpers, and everything else, they're all utility, but unless they fit, they won't fit. So all the spare parts business, all that sort yeah. of stuff, it's cheap expansion of your IP footprint around the world. And some of this protection can last up to 15 years, some 25 years. You just have to pay renewals, which you can also pay through the Hague system. So let's go to the next. So we have, we have a question here though, quick, maybe, does Hague consider functionality as in US design apps? Uh, no, the countries individually consider that, but in the United States, as I said, it's one of the handful of countries that does substantive examination. Now, if you get to an enforcement phase, you know, somebody may uh, talk about functionality like they do here in the United States. You know, it's all functional, so it never should have been granted. But believe me, uh, if you're stopping the people that are just baldly ripping you off, uh, the Hague is the way to go, these industrial design registrations, because they can also be enforced by the border. Customs, that's right. You can get stuff stopped before it even shows up. Uh, all right, the Hague and the national route, just what I said. It's one, 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 all the way down the left column. It's many, 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 many down the right hand column. So, what does many translate into? I might as well have put dollar signs there, okay? Many equals dollars. 
that your client doesn't want to separate with. Here's the coverage of uh, Haig at the moment. The big hole in that coverage, of course, for commercial purposes is uh, China, but that hole is going to be filled in this year. So you can see it's sort of a northern hemisphere thing at the moment with uh, some in Africa. This is Haig, not PCT, but as you can see, uh, it, is, it is filling in. It is filling in. Uh, now, here's something you don't know exists, but I'm going to have to uh, tell you about it. In the United States, we don't publish design applications. We don't. We file them, and either you get a patent or they go abandoned. Well, guess what happens when you file through the Hague system? You get a published international design registration. What does that kick off with respect to the United States? Let's not talk about any other country at the moment, just the U.S. It kicks off provisional rights. You go, what? Provisional rights? Yeah, you remember that thing. It started with the American Inventors Protection Act uh, when we started publishing applications back in November of uh, in November 29, 2000. We started with this provisional right. You could get the potential to collect a reasonable royalty from when your application publishes to when you get a patent, if you put people on notice and so forth. All right, well, let's suppose you're making shoes. All right. You get your published international application. You now kick off provisional rights. You tell everybody, look, here's our published international application. Don't rip it off. Then you get your US registration through the Hague. You know, it, it enters through the Hague system, becomes a US filing, and you have divisionals and all that sort of stuff. You end up with all your shoes. All that time, you're eligible to collect a reasonable royalty if somebody rips you off. Here's why. The claims in a design application are what's shown. So there's not going to be any changes from the publication of the international application to what you get as a patent in the United States. So there's identity of claiming. And if you've put them on notice, you're eligible to collect a reasonable royalty. Wow. Now think about that in the apparel industry where things are ripped off almost before the originator can get them to the market. You know, if you if you go to a department store and find a nice luxury good, a watch, a purse, or something like that, you can walk outside and find an almost replica version of it for sale for almost nothing. Why is that? Because rights are hard to get, right? And they're kind of slow. But if you have provisional rights, you have rights the moment you have that international registration that publishes, and that happens within about six months of when you file your Hague application through the United States Patent Office or directly with WIPO. But either way, about six months out, you have rights. There are provisional rights. And it's because something unusual occurs, the published design application. You, most of you listening, didn't know this until right now. I talk about this and people look at me like I've grown a <laughs> hand out of my head. So there it is. Get your rights started now. You know, don't wait. No waiting. All right, Madrid. Quickie on Madrid. Then I have some questions I need to answer for the students at um, PCT Learning Center. Madrid is really nifty, but, okay, it stems from your basic mark and your originating country. And so my advice to you is do your due diligence before you file in the United States to make sure you're going to get the mark and it's going to be useful for the goods that you hope it will be useful for. So don't just file blind. Do the research. Make sure you're going to get a mark in the United States because what happens is your subsequent application through Madrid is all leveraged off that original mark. If it falls, then so does all the other registrations you've obtained. This is within the first five years. So my advice to you is file your US mark and get it, you know, all the way through the process, opposition and everything, then go Madrid. If you're in a hurry, do it all at the same time, but then at least do your due diligence before you file uh, the Madrid application because you want to make sure you've got what you're going to get in the United States. But like Hague, a Madrid filing is an application in all these other countries. So you've accomplished a filing in all these other countries by filing a single Madrid filing. So I really have nothing to say about trademarks because the IP watchdog trademark is probably the most valuable thing I own. <laughs> so I actually rely on professionals to tell me what to do. <laughs> so I used to dabble in trademarks and now I'm like, okay, now that I have something that's really valuable, I, 
I let I, I rely I, re on I rely on the advice of others. All right, no, that, that's a <laughs> that's a good idea, Gene. All right, so now before we um, move on from so so we have just maybe two two uh, two quick questions here All right. about the what is the best PCT authority to use for search best search authority? Do you have a preference? Well, again, if you file out of the U.S., you have a handful to choose from, and they range in expense. Uh, the EPO in the United States are the most expensive, and I think Russia and, and perhaps Korea are the least expensive, uh, and Israel is somewhere in between. So, uh, and these are your choices. If you file out of the U.S., they're prepared to do a search and a report in English. And so I think all of them do a pretty good job, but I would pay strategically. I typically pick the EPO because that is usually my next stop for the yeah. clients on the way through. And so while I'd like to know what Russia thinks or I'd like to know what Korea thinks, really what my client would like uh, to think of is um, what the EPO thinks. On the other hand, if all I want is a positive opinion and, and I've written claims that I think can get past whatever prior art is found, pick a cheap one. Because all you need is a positive opinion if your object is to come back into the U.S. under PPH. And then it appears that you'd be better off filing a Hague application rather than a U.S. application first. Uh, that's correct. And, that, and that's what I try to tell people. And it's because it activates the provisional right uh, um, thing that is simply not possible. Because right now in the U.S. you file a design case and you might get it issued within a year or maybe two. It's interesting how they're they're kind of backed up and they're working their way through. But here's a wrinkle that nobody else, nobody knows about. They're committed by treaty to getting the Hague cases out quickly. Yeah. And so it's an automatic PPH going through Hague with respect to the U.S. because they're treaty committed to doing this within a year. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's really fast, super fast. So come on, there's yeah. no, you file. And that, that's a year in the U.S. It's six months elsewhere, right? Yeah, it, I mean, it zips right along. So and, right and then the last question we have here is: Hague applies the designs. That's correct. That's it. Just 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 designs. Just designs. Utilities P PCT. All right. So I've got a couple of questions from our students in here, just to give you a flavor of some of the questions. It says, the U.S. Patent Office has asked us to provide the foreign priority document for a design application, international design application. We've requested that the Hague, uh, the Hague, da the DAS code, but we realize that the priority number is not what we've listed in the ADS. You know, what do we do? All right, oh. the United States um, uh, has issues with respect to priority documents. And on the design- Has issues, is kind. It's an understatement. On the design side, it's particularly difficult and I, handle inbound Hague origin, uh, they come through WIPO to the United States, and oftentimes I have to end up filing a paper copy of the EU filing, that's the European Union, because designs are handled not by the EPO, but by the EU. They handle both trademarks and uh, design registrations, and you have to do a paper filing here in the United States. So you are looking for a DAS code that may not exist yet, Okay, so go back. Uh, if a DAS code doesn't exist, you're going to have to go back and get an original certified copy, typically in paper. I know this sounds archaic, but they haven't quite caught up on the electronic side on designs like they have uh, with the electronic exchange on the utility side. And so what I'd first do is I'd contact the patent office. I'd call the examiner and say, okay, what exactly is it that you're looking for me to provide and then set about providing that? Because theoretically, there should be nothing further for you to do. The priority document that they're looking for should have been provided to the WIPO already, but perhaps not. And so go ahead and find out from the patent office precisely what they want. You may end up having to submit a paper copy I know, crazy, right? Crazy US talk. mail. All right, next question. In a written opinion from the ISA, that's the International Searching Authority, divides claims into group one and two and finds some of the claims in group two are novel, the rest are not. What's a good strategy for entering the national phase? Thank you for asking this question. Uh, this falls right into what we've just been discussing. You have uh, two sets of claims. One has been given favorable treatment. The other is not. Preliminary amendment, cancel those ugly claims that have not yet been treated favorably. Go with the ones that have, jump onto PPH, 
And then once you've secured allowance or even before, file a divisional uh, uh, to what was left on the table. What a brilliant yeah. strategy. Yeah. What a brilliant you know, strategy. You use your Rocky and Bullwinkle voice when you say, <laughs> thank you for it. Thank you. <laughs> My favorite cartoon growing up was uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, just so you know. The yeah. Flying Squirrel and the Moose. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gene is... Change more into pinky in the brain. Oh no, I I, I do that for you. you know, that's the other one. You said, "What are we gonna do today, brain? Take over the world?" No, but Rocky and Bullwinkle were upstanding uh, young people, always interested in working their way to success. You know, meritocracy. All right. Yeah. Uh, All right. So we have some more questions. A couple here, more. Um, should the PCT be filed as the first application before USPTO? Heck yeah. Yes, should a PCT be filed first? Yes, first, second, or third, doesn't matter. No, first or second, doesn't matter. But most people have already filed a provisional, so that's typically a moot point, you know? Yeah, or filed in their home country first, something. Yeah, least, yeah, something. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think Qualcomm only files PCTs. It's well, just... see, but you you don't want to be worldwide. Your clients don't. They, right. You know, they're, they're just not interested because you don't know enough about it to help them. So, yeah, yeah. you know. So you said file a divisional. I picked that up too. Or do you mean divisional or do you mean in bypass continuation? Well, once you're on file in the United States through in national stage, either through bypass or direct, you can file a divisional off of your national stage filing. But curiosity, uh, curiously, you gotta have submitted the inventor's oath and declaration before you do it. <laughs> Is it a divisional or would it be a continuation at that point? Either one. Yeah. I mean, group run, group two, I don't know how closely oh, yeah. they're okay. related. Right, right, right. I got you. Yeah. Okay. I missed that in the question. Okay. Uh, assuming the provisional is filed with a computer implemented invention that may trigger 101 rejections upon non provisional examination, is it better at 12 months just to file a PCT which designates the US without filing a regular non provisional? Well, Gene's strategy or strategic suggestion here is that the more time you provide before examination begins in the United States with respect to patent eligibility problem cases, the more likely it is you'll have a solution as to what to do uh, to get them through. Yeah, I mean, particularly now because you know, you're you're looking at some some of these cases. The one with uh, Hooke's law, what was that? American Axle. Yeah, yeah, balancing I mean, a drive shaft. Yeah, you know, the Supreme Court is still considering whether to take that, and then now the one uh, um, you versus Apple about the digital camera. I mean, these decisions are becoming idiotic, and one has to wonder whether or not the federal circuit is really making these decisions in order to just drive the system into the ground <laughs> so that the Supreme Court has to, to retrieve, retrieve it. it or whether they really believe that this is the way it is. I mean, I can't imagine that these judges believe what they're actually writing. I mean, because it, it, it's, it's nonsensical. But at some point, we're going to get to the theater of the absurd. I think we've long been there. But even the the even the most recalcitrant judge has to see that we're very close to, to that. But but Gene, you know, I, I uh, would want to argue with you about that or debate it, but I've heard them say from the bench and in their written opinions that we may not agree with the outcome, but we're obliged to go with what this is yeah. owing to precedent from the Supreme Court. And they've done that a few times in diagnostic cases where they go, this is a huge advance. Right. No doubt many people are better off. No doubt this is the reason for our patent one system. One of the top 10, in one case, one of the top 10 medical advances of all time. But, but we are obliged to go with the decision we have because right. of precedent. Even Judge Dyke, and I say even him because he would be more on the uh, <clears throat> wing of the, the federal circuit that finds things uh, patent ineligible more often, but he's found... In the Finjan case, he wrote that, and that was patent eligible. But he has written that uh, any more guidance needs to come from the Supreme Court, not the Federal Circuit. And you know that that is a judicial philosophy that is hard to argue with, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because that is the way things normally work. Uh, it's just that the Supreme Court has abdicated in this area, and Congress has abdicated in this area. So we're left with these decisions getting more and more absurd. Um, they're inching to the point where some of these things are just not worth filing. So I don't think that 
they're not worth filing, but they're certainly not worth rushing the prosecution on because the patent office right now is issuing stuff and they're issuing stuff on what I think makes sense. sense. You know, the test makes sense. The 2019 guidance makes all the sense of the world. It's just that nobody's following it in, once you get to the courts. Yeah, yeah. Once you get to the district courts and the CAFC, they go, well, you know, the patent office, it's their guidelines, but so. So you have yeah. to let, I think, the courts catch up. Um, so that's why PCT 30 months, I think is pretty attractive. All right, Gene, well, our hour has passed. Yes. And so thank you very much for being a guest in your own oh, studio. No, no problem. And I, I look forward to having you back, let's say in December. Sure. And so uh, here's how you can get in touch with PCT <clears throat> Learning Center. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, John has a, a wonderful staff who keeps his socially, <laughs> socially, uh, socially aware media aware. And then what we would also appreciate is on the way out as you leave the webinar today, you'll have the opportunity to give feedback in your survey. We will take a look at that. John and his staff will go over, over all that feedback. We do the same here as well. We get some of our best ideas for future programs and panels from you guys. So please, it will only take you 60 seconds. It's a very quick survey, but we really appreciate your feedback. So if you have a mm -hmm. moment, please do that. And uh, John, you'll see your students next month. And I will see everybody next month. Uh, I'll give you a date here after a while and uh, you know, we'll be talking. Great, and uh, let me just make a plug. We'll both be in Texas in September. So hopefully if you uh, wanna get back to in-person events, we'll be in Dallas, Texas at IP Watchdog Live. We have a great program, so check it out on ipwatchdog.com. Um, you can navigate through to the microsite and check out, we have uh, 90 confirmed speakers. Judge Albright is gonna deliver the opening remarks on, on Sunday. We have a couple more surprises that will be announced, I think, shortly with more speakers announced very soon. So um, a lot of great panels. So looking forward to hosting you guys if you're available. All right, well, thank you very much, Gene, and thank you, IP Watchdog. It's always great to work hand in hand with you guys, so thanks. Great, we'll take care and we'll see you all soon.